Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. Before I dive into today's stories, I want to say, disclaimer, the content presented in the video is purely for entertainment purposes only. The theories and stories discussed in this video are speculative and are not supported by any evidence or proof. Viewer discretion is advised. I've always been a huge fan of PC games. Ever since I was a kid, I loved anything that was a little off the beaten path. Those weird indie games no one had heard of. Mods that completely changed the base game into something unrecognizable, that sort of thing. So when a friend told me about the dark web and how you could find these exclusive games there, my curiosity naturally got the better of me. It didn't happen right away. I spent weeks thinking about it researching how to even access the dark web. It felt like stepping into a completely different world. Most of the warnings I read online were about staying away from anything involving illegal activity. But games, those seemed harmless enough. Just another underground part of the internet. One late night after a few drinks and some poor decision making, I decided to go for it. I downloaded Tor, set up a VPN, I'm not a complete idiot, and found myself browsing through sketchy forums full of questionable content. But after some digging, I found a thread that stood out, the game that knows you. The description was vague, something about it being the last game you'll ever need, promising a unique, personalized experience. The comments were mixed. Some called it a life-changing experience. Others said it was a curse. A couple of people warned that it wasn't worth the risk, that people had gone missing after playing it. I didn't believe that, obviously. It sounded like classic internet urban legend stuff, but I was intrigued. I found a download link buried deep in the replies. No previews, no screenshots, just a single file with a generic name, unknown.x. Not very subtle, I know. I should have stopped there, but again, curiosity got the better of me. The file was surprisingly small, which seemed odd for a game, but I shrugged it off and downloaded it. The installation was weirdly fast, like almost too fast. I figured it must be one of those minimalist games, maybe pixel art or text-based. But when I launched it, the screen just went black. For a few seconds, I thought it had crashed, but then something started happening. Text appeared line by line like it was being typed out live. Welcome back, Alex Williams. It's been a long time. That was unsettling, but not impossible. I figured the game must have scraped my name from my PC somewhere, like an old saved profile from a different game or a username linked to my computer. Not a big deal, just a clever trick. But then it got weirder. The game didn't have any menu, no settings, no start button. It just faded into what looked like a standard first person environment, dark, Dingy hallways with flickering lights, very Silent Hill-esque. I started walking, but the controls felt sluggish, like there was a slight delay between my inputs and the character's movements. It gave me this uneasy, disconnected feeling, but I assumed it was just bad programming. Then, the sound kicked in. Not music, not ambient noise. Just a low, constant hum, almost like the buzzing of a power line. The further I walked, the louder it got, until it started to feel like it was coming from inside my own head. I pressed on, though, because something about this game just felt wrong, but I couldn't look away. I had to see where it was going. After about ten minutes of aimless wandering, I reached a door. As soon as I opened it, my screen went black again. But instead of a loading screen, there was a voice. My voice. Not some generic sound clip either. It was me. I could hear myself talking, having a conversation I'd had earlier that day, word for word. It was the exact discussion I'd had with my friend about ordering pizza. The voice wasn't coming from the game, it was coming from my speakers. Somehow the game was playing back a conversation it had no way of knowing about. I immediately alt-tabbed out of the game, heart racing and started looking through my PC for any sign of spyware or anything that could explain what was going on. 
but everything looked clean. No weird processes, no extra files in the game's directory. Nothing that would explain how it was able to access my private conversations. At this point, I was done. I shut the game down and deleted the file from my computer. I even disconnected from the internet for the rest of the night, just to be safe. But that wasn't the end of it. Far from it. A couple of days later, I started getting these weird phone calls. They were from blocked numbers, so I never picked up. But they'd leave voicemails. And the voicemails? They were just static. Not the creepy kind you hear in horror movies, but that kind of low crackling static that seems like it's hiding something just below the surface. I brushed it off at first, assuming it was just a glitch or spam, but the timing was too suspicious. It had to be related to the game. That's when I noticed something else. My phone would randomly turn off like it had run out of battery, even when it was fully charged. And my PC? It started behaving oddly. Programs would close on their own, files would go missing, and sometimes when I'd log in, I'd find random system errors as if someone had been messing around with it when I wasn't looking. I knew I'd messed up. I thought deleting the game would be enough, but clearly something had stuck around, something I couldn't see or find. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched or worse monitored somehow. It was around this time that I noticed a black SUV parked down the street from my house. It wasn't always there, but often enough that it caught my attention. Maybe I was just being paranoid, but it felt like too much of a coincidence. After the weird static voicemails and the odd behavior of my devices, I tried to convince myself that I was overthinking things. Maybe my phone was just old, or I had accidentally downloaded some malware when I was messing around on the dark web. That stuff happens all the time, right? But the SUV, that was harder to ignore. It didn't park directly in front of my house, but always in the same spot down the street, just close enough that I could see it from my window. At first, I thought it was just one of the neighbor's cars, maybe a friend of theirs who visited a lot. But the more I paid attention, the less normal it seemed. The car never moved during the day. I'd go out for groceries, to work, even take a walk around the block, and it was always there, just sitting in the same spot. I tried to get a better look at it a few times. You know how it is. If something feels off, you want to gather as much information as you can. I'd pretend to take out the trash or walk my dog, which I didn't have, but, you know, excuses. The windows were tinted, of course, so I couldn't see inside, but it was the kind of car that made me uneasy. It was spotless, not a speck of dirt or scratch on it, which seemed weird for a car parked on the street all the time. It didn't feel like it belonged there. I considered telling someone about it, friends, family, but the more I thought about it, the more ridiculous it sounded. Hey, there's this black SUV parked down the street, and I'm pretty sure it's watching me. Yeah, that would go over well. People already thought I spent too much time online as it was. So, I kept it to myself, hoping that maybe I was just being paranoid. But then something happened that I couldn't ignore. One night, about a week after I deleted that game, I was working late on my computer. I do some freelance design work, and I was on a deadline, so I had a lot of windows open. Photoshop, a browser, Spotify playing in the background. Everything was fine until all of a sudden my screen went black. Not a blue screen of death, not a crash, just pure black, like the monitor had turned itself off. I moved the mouse, tapped the keyboard, but nothing brought it back. Frustrated, I tried restarting the PC, but even that didn't work. Then, just as suddenly as it had gone dark, the screen flickered back on. But something was wrong. Every single one of my open programs had closed and there was a single window left on my screen. It wasn't a program I'd open, just a plain black window with a blinking cursor. Before I could even process what was happening, text began to appear in the window, like someone was typing directly into my computer. You shouldn't have deleted the game. I sat there staring at the screen. My hands hovered over the keyboard, but I didn't know what to type. Was this some kind of prank? A virus messing with me? But before I could figure out what to do next, more text appeared. 
We know who you are. We know where you are. My heart was pounding, and I could feel the heat rising in my face. I tried to alt-tab, control alt delete anything to get out of whatever this was, but nothing worked. The window stayed right there as if it had taken over my entire system. Then, the screen went black again. I shut the computer down manually, holding the power button until the fan stopped spinning. I couldn't take my eyes off the monitor. Was this some elaborate scare tactic? A hacker trying to mess with me? Or was it something more? The game hadn't seemed like anything more than a creepy gimmick when I first downloaded it, but this felt like it had gone way beyond that. That night, I barely slept. My phone, which I kept next to my bed, wouldn't stop glitching. Random static-filled notifications, apps opening and closing by themselves. I tried powering it down, but somehow it would just turn itself back on. I eventually tossed it across the room, hoping a few hours of peace would come. But the uneasiness stuck with me. The next morning, I woke up to find a letter slipped under my door. Not through the mail slot, but actually wedged under the front door, like someone had placed it there by hand. I don't know why, but the moment I saw it, my stomach sank. There was no address, no stamp, just a plain white envelope with my name written on it in neat, precise handwriting. I opened it up and found a single sheet of paper inside. There wasn't much written, just a few lines. We are aware of your recent activity. Cease all further actions. This is your final warning. I read it over a dozen times, trying to make sense of it. Who was we? The government? Some hacker collective? Or worse, whoever had been messing with my computer and phone? And what actions were they talking about? Downloading a stupid game? I wasn't sure what to do next. I had no idea how serious this was, but the fact that someone had physically come to my house to deliver that note, it felt personal. It wasn't just some random prank. I decided to lay low for a while. No more dark web, no more sketchy games. I even stayed off social media just to be safe. I kept a close eye on the black SUV, but it never moved. It just sat there day after day, like a silent reminder that someone somewhere was watching me. Then one day the SUV was gone. It vanished as quietly as it had appeared. No tire marks, no sign it had ever been there. At first I felt a wave of relief. Maybe it was over. Maybe they'd gotten bored or I wasn't worth their time anymore. I tried to go back to normal life though the anxiety never fully went away. But then, about two weeks later, something new happened. I came home from work to find my front door slightly ajar. I stood there, frozen on the front step, staring at the crack where the door should have been locked. My heart was racing, but I knew I had locked it. I always locked it. The feeling of being watched, of being invaded, had returned, stronger than ever. I stepped inside and immediately noticed something was off. Nothing was stolen, nothing was damaged but someone had been in my house. I could feel it. Everything was just slightly out of place. The remote wasn't where I'd left it. My chair was pushed in differently. The stack of mail on the counter had been shuffled through. And on my desk, next to my powered off computer, was another letter. This one was typed, not handwritten, and only had two words. Final warning. I had no idea what I was supposed to do next. After I found that second letter, my first instinct was to get out of the house. I didn't care what it said anymore. I wasn't about to wait around and see what happened next. I grabbed my jacket, stuffed my laptop into my bag, and left, locking the door behind me. I didn't even know where I was going. I just needed to clear my head and figure out what was going on. I walked around the neighborhood for a while, trying to wrap my mind around what was happening. It was a weird feeling knowing that someone had been in my home. They hadn't taken anything, hadn't broken anything. But somehow, that made it worse. The subtle invasion was unnerving. It was as if they wanted me to know they could come in whenever they wanted, like they were in control. The idea that I was being targeted because of that game seemed ridiculous. Who goes to these lengths over a random PC game? 
It didn't make sense. I kept telling myself that over and over, but at the same time I couldn't shake the feeling that the game had been the trigger. Ever since I'd played it, everything had spiraled into this bizarre, unexplainable situation. I decided to get in touch with my friend, the same one who'd first told me about the dark web. He was more experienced with that stuff and might have an idea of what I was dealing with. We hadn't talked much since I'd downloaded the game, so I figured it was time to fill him in. I texted him asking if we could meet up, and a few minutes later he replied, Sure, man. My place in 20? I hopped in my car and headed over. His apartment was across town, and the drive gave me time to think. A million different possibilities ran through my mind. Hacking, government surveillance, some creepy ARG, but none of it fit neatly together. By the time I pulled into his parking lot, I had more questions than answers. When I got to his door, something felt off. I knocked, but there was no response. I knocked again, harder this time, and finally the door creaked open. My friend stood there looking... different. He was pale with these dark circles under his eyes like he hadn't slept in days. Hey man, you good? I asked, trying to play it cool, but I could already tell something was wrong. He stepped aside to let me in and I immediately noticed his place was a mess. Pizza boxes were stacked on the table, random junk was scattered across the floor, and his computer was on, but the screen was black. He wasn't usually like this. His apartment was never spotless, but it was never this chaotic either. We sat down, and I explained everything that had been happening. The game, the letters, the SUV, the strange things happening with my devices. As I talked, he just stared at me, not saying much but the look on his face told me he already knew what I was going to say. Finally, when I finished, he spoke. You shouldn't have played that game, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. I blinked, caught off guard by how serious he sounded. What do you mean? He leaned forward, glancing around the room like he was making sure no one else could hear us. There's this... group. I don't know what they're called or how they operate exactly but they're connected to certain things on the dark web. Games, files, stuff you're not supposed to see. If you access the wrong thing, they come after you. I laughed nervously. Come on, man. That sounds like some conspiracy theory nonsense. You really think some secret group is messing with me because I downloaded a weird game? He didn't smile. It's not just a game, it's like a trap. A way to hook people in, see what they're willing to do. The more you interact with it, the deeper you get and the more attention you attract. You must have tripped something when you played it. I was about to ask what he meant when he stood up suddenly, walked over to his computer and turned the monitor on. At first, nothing happened. Then, just like what had happened to me, a black screen with a blinking cursor appeared. Stop looking. The words popped up on the screen and I felt that familiar knot in my stomach. I looked back at my friend, but he was staring at the screen completely unfazed. How long has this been going on? I asked, my voice quieter than I intended. He didn't answer right away. Instead, he turned away from the computer and looked out the window. Ever since I first told you about the dark web, he muttered, they started messing with me too. I thought it was just some prank or a virus, but it hasn't stopped. They keep watching. That word, watching, sent a chill down my spine, though I didn't want to admit it. I started connecting dots I hadn't before. If he was being monitored too, then it wasn't just me. But why? Neither of us had done anything illegal. Sure, we'd browsed sketchy websites, but we weren't involved in any criminal activity. We were just curious, messing around like countless other people do online. Why didn't you warn me? I asked, feeling a mix of anger and confusion. I tried, but it was too late. Once they've got your information, once you've interacted with their stuff, they don't let go. He turned back to face me, his eyes wide with something I hadn't seen before. Fear. The letters? The SUV? That's just the beginning. They're testing you. Testing me? For what? For how far you'll go. What you'll do to protect yourself how much they can control you. He paused, taking a deep breath. The more you try to resist, the worse it gets. 
I sat there trying to process what he was saying. It didn't make sense. It couldn't make sense. But at the same time, everything he said lined up with what had been happening to me. The game wasn't just some random file. It was a gateway. A way for these people, whoever they were, to get inside my life. Suddenly, my phone buzzed in my pocket, snapping me back to reality. I pulled it out, and sure enough, it was another blocked number. Without thinking, I handed the phone to my friend. Answer it, I said. I don't know why, but I felt like I couldn't handle hearing another static-filled voicemail. He hesitated, then hit the answer button and put the phone on speaker. At first, there was silence. Then, a voice, low and distorted, spoke. You've been warned. Do not make this harder. The call ended abruptly. No static this time, no noise at all, just dead air. I grabbed my phone back, heart pounding. What do they want from me? I asked, half to myself, half to my friend. They want you to stop digging, to let go. If you don't, they'll keep tightening the noose. And believe me, you don't want to find out what happens when they're done playing around. I didn't know what to say. What could I say? I was stuck. I'd gotten involved in something way over my head and now I was trapped in a game I never signed up for. And the worst part? I didn't even know what my next move should be. Leaving my friend's apartment, I felt this heavy weight pressing down on me. I had a decision to make. Either I could do as they said, stop asking questions and hope they'd back off, or I could keep pushing and find out what this whole thing was really about. As I drove home, one thing became clear. Whatever was happening to me wasn't over. It was just beginning. I spent the next few days doing my best to lay low. No more digging, no more questions. I went to work, came home, kept my head down. But the problem was, even though I'd stopped looking for answers, they hadn't stopped watching. The first sign that things were escalating came three days after I'd left my friend's apartment. I was heading home from work, the usual commute, nothing out of the ordinary, until I noticed something. You know how, when you're driving, you don't pay attention to every single car around you? Well, for some reason, I did that day, and I saw it again, the black SUV. At first, I thought it was just a coincidence. A lot of people drive black SUVs, right? But the more I watched it in my rearview mirror, the more I realized it was following me. No matter what turns I took, whether I sped up or slowed down, it stayed behind me at a consistent distance. Close enough to let me know it was there, but not close enough to look suspicious to anyone else. I tried to shake it off, telling myself it was just my nerves getting to me. Maybe I was seeing things that weren't there. But when I pulled into my driveway and saw the SUV roll to a stop a few houses down, I knew it was real. I didn't get out of my car right away. I sat there for a minute gripping the steering wheel, watching the SUV from the corner of my eye. It just sat there. No one got out. No lights flashed. It was like they wanted me to know they were still watching without making a move. I finally got out and walked to my front door, pretending like everything was normal but I couldn't shake the feeling of being observed. And it wasn't just the SUV anymore. It was everywhere I went. The next morning, I woke up to an email from an address I didn't recognize. The subject line was blank, but when I opened it, there was a single message inside. This is your last chance. There was no signature, no way to reply. Just those five words hanging in my inbox like a threat. My hands were shaking as I read it over and over trying to figure out what they meant by last chance. Last chance for what? To stop looking? To get out? But I wasn't doing anything anymore. I'd left it alone, like they'd wanted. I didn't tell anyone about the email. I figured if they were serious about their warning, I didn't want to drag anyone else into it. But the problem with keeping secrets is that they have a way of getting under your skin. The more I tried to ignore it, the more I felt like I was walking around with a target on my back. And it wasn't just a feeling. Things started happening at work, small things at first, 
Files I'd been working on would disappear from my computer. Emails I'd sent would show up blank on the other end. My boss called me into his office one afternoon, asking why I hadn't submitted a project I'd finished two days earlier. I knew I had, but when I checked, it was gone from our shared server. No trace of it, like it had never existed. At home, it was worse. My internet would drop at random times, but only when I was in the middle of searching for something. When I'd checked the router, everything was fine. No outages in the area. It was like someone was remotely cutting off my connection whenever they saw me going too far down a certain path. I couldn't use my phone without getting hit with strange notifications that made no sense. Apps I didn't recognize. Location services being turned on without my input. Calls I'd never made showing up in my history. And every now and then I'd hear this soft click when I was on a call, like someone was listening in. Again, subtle enough that you might brush it off as nothing. But when you're paranoid, those little things start to add up. Then, one night something happened that made me realize just how serious this had become. It was around 2 a.m. and I was in bed, half asleep, when I heard it. A faint thud from somewhere downstairs. At first I thought it was just the house settling, the usual creaks and groans of old wood shifting. But then I heard it again, louder this time, a distinct, deliberate sound like someone moving around. I sat up, heart pounding in my chest, straining to hear. Another noise. This time, the unmistakable sound of a door being closed, slowly, quietly. I grabbed my phone from the nightstand and opened the security camera app I'd installed after everything started. I had a couple of cameras set up outside and one in the hallway downstairs. The feed loaded, and I could see the dim glow of the streetlight through the front window. Nothing seemed out of place. I switched to the hallway camera, and that's when I saw it. There, at the bottom of the stairs, was a shadow. A person. They were standing perfectly still, just out of view of the camera, but I could see enough to know someone was in my house. My entire body froze. I couldn't even think straight, just sat there, staring at the screen, hoping the figure would move, leave, do something. But they didn't. They just stood there. I don't know how long I sat like that, waiting for them to move, waiting for something to happen, but eventually I heard the sound of the front door opening. I flipped back to the outside camera, just in time to see the figure slipping out the front door and disappearing into the night. I didn't sleep at all after that. I checked every lock, every window, made sure everything was secured. But the damage had already been done. They'd been inside my house again. Whoever they were, they had access to my life in a way that I couldn't stop. I tried calling the police the next day, but that didn't go anywhere. I gave them the footage, told them about the break-in, but without anything stolen or any evidence of forced entry, there wasn't much they could do. Keep an eye out, they said. Make sure you lock your doors. As if I wasn't already doing that. But the thing is, it wasn't just about locking doors anymore. Whoever these people were, they didn't need to break in to mess with me. They had already made it clear that they could get into my life without leaving a trace. I had no idea how deep this went or how much worse it could get, but I knew one thing for sure. They weren't done with me yet. After the break-in, I knew I couldn't stay in my house any longer. It wasn't about locks or alarms anymore. It was about the fact that whoever was doing this had access to my life in ways I couldn't even comprehend. And it wasn't just physical. They were in my devices, in my home, in my head. Every step I took to secure myself felt like it was undone before I could even finish. I packed a bag that night and left. I didn't tell anyone where I was going, not my family, not my friends. I rented a cheap motel room on the outskirts of town, paid in cash, and didn't use my credit card or phone for anything. I figured if I went completely off the grid, maybe I could at least get a few nights of peace. But deep down, I knew that wasn't going to happen. The first night in the motel was uneventful. For the first time in weeks, I slept a full night without being woken up by strange noises or my phone buzzing with cryptic messages. 
For a brief moment, I let myself believe that maybe, just maybe, I'd managed to escape whatever game I'd been dragged into. But that hope didn't last long. On the second night, I woke up around 3 a.m. to the sound of my phone buzzing. I didn't remember turning it back on, but there it was, glowing on the bedside table. I reached for it, half expecting another blocked number or anonymous message. But when I looked at the screen, it was something worse. It was a live feed from inside the motel room. For a split second, I thought it was just my camera app glitching or something. But then I realized it was showing me in real time, lying in bed, looking at my phone. The angle was from above, like it was coming from a camera hidden in the ceiling or somewhere I couldn't see. I shot out of bed, heart racing, frantically looking around the room for anything out of place. I tore through the corners, checked behind the curtains, even opened up the vent above the bathroom. Nothing. No cameras, no wires. But the feed kept going. That's when I knew. They were still watching me. They'd always been watching me. No matter where I went or what I did, they were one step ahead. I turned the phone off and threw it across the room, but I knew it was too late for that. I sat on the edge of the bed, trying to figure out what to do next. I couldn't go home. I couldn't go to the police. They'd already brushed me off once. But I couldn't stay here either, not when they clearly had eyes on me. I was out of options, and the more I thought about it, the more trapped I felt. And then, almost as if they were reading my mind, my phone buzzed again. Despite everything in me screaming not to, I picked it up and checked the screen. A message this time. Meet us. Now. There was no address, no instructions, but somehow I knew exactly what they meant. I had driven by it a hundred times without thinking twice. The old abandoned warehouse on the edge of town. It was one of those places no one ever went to anymore. A relic of an industrial past that had long since moved on. If they wanted to confront me, that's where it would be. I debated for a long time whether to go. It felt like a trap. But at the same time, I couldn't keep running forever. If this was my only shot at ending it, I had to take it. So I grabbed my bag, left the motel, and drove into the night, heading toward the warehouse. When I arrived, the place was just as deserted as I expected. The building loomed in the darkness, the windows long since shattered, the walls covered in graffiti. There were no cars, no signs of life, just the quiet hum of the night around me. I stepped out of the car, half expecting something to happen immediately. But nothing did. The place was eerily silent. I made my way toward the entrance, the gravel crunching under my shoes, the only sound in the stillness. Every step felt like I was walking into something I couldn't come back from, but I forced myself to keep going. Inside, the warehouse was just as empty as the outside. Rows of old machinery stood like rusted skeletons, covered in dust and cobwebs. I called out, but my voice echoed back at me, unanswered. That's when I saw it. In the middle of the warehouse, where the light from the broken windows barely reached, there was a single desk, and sitting on that desk was a laptop. I approached it cautiously, my heart pounding in my chest. The screen was already on, displaying a blank page with a single line of text. It's time to finish the game. I stared at the screen, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. Finish the game? What game? Was this still about the stupid PC game I'd downloaded weeks ago? I hadn't played it since I deleted it. I thought I'd gotten rid of it for good. But then, almost as if it had been waiting for me to think that, a new message appeared. Play. The cursor blinked expectantly. I sat down in the chair, hands hovering over the keyboard, unsure of what would happen if I actually followed through. But at this point, what choice did I have? I opened the laptop's folder and there it was. Unknown.exe. The game I thought I'd deleted. The game I'd tried so hard to forget. It was still here, waiting for me. I double-clicked the icon and the screen went black for a moment. Then, just like the first time the text started appearing, Welcome back, Alex. You should have listened. 
This time, though, there were no flickering hallways, no slow, sluggish controls, just darkness and silence. And then my screen split in two. On the left was a live feed of me sitting at the desk, staring at the laptop. On the right, a new message appeared. You are free to leave, but if you do, we will always be with you. The camera feed on the left zoomed in slowly, locking in on my face, my eyes wide with confusion and fear. Then one final message popped up. Or you can stay and finish the game. I sat there, hands trembling over the keys, staring at my reflection in the screen. I didn't know what finishing the game meant, but I had a feeling it wasn't just about winning or losing. It was about control about letting them decide how far I was willing to go. So, there I was. I could walk away, never knowing who was behind all of this, or I could play their game, keep going deeper, and see how much further it would take me. But something told me that no matter what I chose, they'd always be watching. I closed the laptop and walked away. The SUV hasn't returned, the letters have stopped, and my phone is quiet now, but every so often I catch myself looking over my shoulder, wondering if they're still there, waiting for me to make the next move. I don't think this is over, not by a long shot. I've always considered myself pretty tech savvy. I'm not some hacker genius or anything, but I know my way around a computer more than the average person. That's probably why the dark web always intrigued me. You hear all these stories about it, the weird, illegal stuff people sell, the creepy forums, the shadowy figures lurking in corners of the internet that most of us will never see. I never really thought it was real, though. I assumed it was just exaggerated urban legends meant to spook people, but like any bored 20-something, I wanted to see for myself. I'm not reckless, though. I didn't just jump into this blindly. I did my research, watched a bunch of YouTube videos on Tor, VPNs, and how to stay anonymous. All of them pretty much say the same thing. Don't click on anything sketchy, don't buy anything, and most importantly, don't trust anyone. Easy enough, right? So, one random Thursday night, I finally decided to take the plunge. I downloaded Tor, set up a VPN, and I was in. At first it was underwhelming. It just felt like another version of the internet, but uglier and slower. There were marketplaces, forums, and a bunch of other stuff, but nothing that screamed dangerous or mysterious. Honestly, I almost closed my browser and called it a night, but then I found something odd, a link that was just a string of random letters and numbers, nothing that made sense. The weird thing was, this link didn't have a description like all the others. It was just... there. Curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked it. The page that loaded looked like something from the early 2000s. Black background, plain white text, no pictures, no pop-ups, no weird ads. It was just a simple chat room with a list of usernames. Most of them were random combinations of letters and numbers, but one stood out. Zero, zero. I didn't want to interact, so I just sat there watching. The chat wasn't fast. In fact, it felt like there were only a few people in the room, and they were talking in cryptic sentences. I couldn't make sense of most of it. But I remember this one exchange that still sticks with me. User 241. Is it ready? Zero, zero. Tomorrow. Midnight. And then there was just silence. It was strange, but not enough to freak me out. I figured it was some kind of role play or maybe a coded conversation about an online sale. Either way, I decided I had seen enough for one night. I shut down my laptop, cleared my cache, and went to bed, laughing at myself for being so paranoid. I didn't think much of it the next morning. Life went on as usual. I went to work, met up with some friends afterward, and completely forgot about my little adventure on the dark web. It wasn't until I got home later that evening that things started to feel off. There was an envelope slipped under my front door. No address, no stamps, nothing. Just a plain black envelope. 
I should have been more alarmed, but I was more confused than anything. I picked it up, sat on my couch, and opened it. Inside was a single piece of paper. No letterhead, no signature. Just one line written in what looked like typewriter font. We know. That was it. No explanation. No context. Just those two words staring back at me. At first, I thought it was some prank. Maybe one of my friends somehow found out about my dark web curiosity and was messing with me. I even texted a couple of them to see if they were behind it, but they all denied it. A couple of them didn't even know what the dark web was. That's when the uneasiness started to creep in. I tried to brush it off. Maybe it was just a coincidence or some weird joke. But as I went about the rest of my evening, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. The house felt different. It's hard to explain, but it was like the air had changed. You know that sensation when you walk into a room and someone's just been talking about you? Yeah, it was kind of like that, except I was alone. I spent the rest of the night trying to distract myself. Netflix, YouTube, whatever I could find to take my mind off that stupid letter. But every now and then, I'd glance over at the envelope sitting on the coffee table, just sitting there like it was waiting for me to acknowledge it. Eventually, I decided to go to bed early, hoping a good night's sleep would reset everything. But as I lay there, staring at the ceiling, that nagging thought wouldn't leave me alone. Who sent the letter? And how did they know? I had been careful. I didn't share any personal information didn't even use my main laptop. I followed all the steps to stay anonymous. So how could they know? I finally managed to drift off to sleep sometime after midnight, trying to convince myself it was all in my head. The next morning, things took an even stranger turn. I woke up to the sound of my doorbell ringing. Groggy and still half asleep, I stumbled to the door, expecting a package or maybe my neighbor. Instead, I was greeted by two police officers standing on my front porch. Their faces were unreadable, but their presence immediately sent a jolt of anxiety through me. Are you Martin? One of them asked, his voice calm but firm. Uh, yeah, I replied, my voice still groggy from sleep. We need to talk, the other officer said, stepping closer. May we come inside? At that point, any remaining trace of sleep was gone. My heart was racing and a hundred questions ran through my head. Why were they here? What did they want? And most importantly, did this have anything to do with that black letter? I stepped aside, letting them in, trying to keep my face as neutral as possible. The officers stepped into my living room and the atmosphere instantly felt tense. I tried to act casual, but my mind was racing. Why were they here? What did they want from me? I offered them a seat on the couch, but they remained standing, which only made the whole situation feel even more uncomfortable. Is something wrong? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. One of the officers, a tall guy with a graying beard, glanced around the room before looking back at me. His partner, a shorter woman with dark hair pulled into a tight bun, held a folder close to her chest, but didn't open it. We're investigating something, the taller one said. We received a report about some suspicious online activity that might be linked to this address. I blinked. Online activity? Suspicious. How? I asked, my voice trailing off. The shorter officer finally spoke up. We don't have all the details yet but we have reason to believe someone connected to this address accessed parts of the internet that are less than legal. Have you been on the dark web recently? At that moment, my stomach dropped. I tried to play it cool, but I could feel my palms starting to sweat. I hadn't done anything illegal, just some harmless browsing, but now the police were at my door asking me about the dark web. It felt too coincidental especially after receiving that black letter the night before. I, I mean, I know what it is, but I haven't really done anything on there, I stammered. It wasn't technically a lie, but I wasn't about to admit I'd been poking around in shady chat rooms less than 24 hours ago. The officers exchanged a look, 
The woman flipped open the folder, revealing a single sheet of paper. She didn't show it to me, but her eyes scanned it as if she were double-checking something. We received a tip about a specific chat room, one that's known to be used for illegal transactions, trafficking, and other activities. Were you in any such chat rooms? No, I said quickly. Nothing like that. I wasn't lying. Sure, I had visited that weird chat room with the cryptic conversation, but I hadn't seen anything explicitly illegal. Just... odd, and definitely nothing about trafficking or anything like that. The taller officer scratched his beard and sighed. Look, we're not here to accuse you of anything. But if you've been accessing places you shouldn't be, even out of curiosity, it's important you're upfront with us. People on those parts of the web, they aren't exactly the kind you want to get mixed up with. I nodded, doing my best to stay calm. I understand, but honestly, I didn't do anything. I was just curious, that's all. The woman closed the folder and gave me a long, hard look. If you remember anything that could help, let us know. We'll be monitoring certain networks for a while. It's better to be safe than sorry. With that, they thanked me for my time and headed for the door. I followed them, still trying to process everything. I had been so careful when I was on the dark web, but now somehow the police knew about it. And on top of that, they had received a tip. From who? My mind raced, thinking of all the possibilities, but none of them made sense. As they left, the female officer handed me a card with a number scrawled on it in pen. If you notice anything strange, or if you remember something, give us a call. You'd be surprised how often people get in over their heads without realizing it. I nodded again and they walked down the driveway to their cruiser. I stood there for a moment, watching them drive away before I finally shut the door. The second the door clicked shut, I sat down on the couch, my head in my hands. What was happening? I wasn't involved in anything illegal, so why was I being watched? More importantly, who tipped them off about me? I reached for my phone to text my friends, but I hesitated. What was I going to say? Hey, guess what? The cops just showed up at my place asking about the dark web. That didn't exactly seem like a casual conversation starter. Instead, I decided to go back to the beginning and figure out what might have set everything in motion. I opened my laptop, turned on the VPN again, and hesitated for a moment before opening Tor. I knew it was risky after what just happened, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I went back to the same page, the one with the chat room. I wanted to see if there were any new messages, anything that might explain what I had gotten myself into. But when the page loaded, I felt my heart skip a beat. The chat room was gone. It wasn't just inactive or slow. It was completely gone, like it had never existed in the first place. I refreshed the page, tried entering the URL manually again, but it was no use. The site didn't exist anymore. I was staring at the blank page when I heard a soft thud behind me. My heart leaped into my throat as I spun around, but there was nothing there just my empty living room. At first I thought maybe it was just my imagination, or maybe something had fallen off a shelf. But then I saw it. Another black envelope. This time it wasn't slipped under the door. It was sitting on my kitchen counter, placed neatly next to my coffee machine. I didn't need to open it to know it contained another message. I stared at the black envelope on my kitchen counter, my mind trying to make sense of how it got there. It wasn't like someone had slipped it under the door while I wasn't looking. No, this was different. Someone had been inside my house. Someone had stood right here in my kitchen while I was distracted with the police at the front door. I felt a rising unease as I approached the envelope. The logical part of me wanted to believe there had to be some explanation. A prank, maybe? but I couldn't shake the feeling that this was something else. Whoever had sent this letter wasn't playing a joke. I picked it up, running my fingers over the smooth black paper. It was identical to the one from the night before. Plain, unmarked, with the same weight and texture. I took a deep breath, slid my finger under the flap, 
and carefully opened it. Inside was another sheet of paper, the same as before. One sentence, typed in that same old typewriter-style font, you were warned. My stomach churned as I read the words over and over again. Warned? Warned about what? I hadn't done anything, at least nothing that I thought would trigger this kind of response. It was just a chat room, a weird one, sure, but nothing more than that. I hadn't interacted with anyone. I hadn't clicked on any suspicious links. I'd followed the rules. But then I thought back to that username, zero zero, the cryptic conversation about something happening tomorrow. Was that what this was about? Had I stumbled onto something I wasn't supposed to see? I looked around my kitchen, suddenly hyper-aware of my surroundings. The place felt different now, violated almost. Someone had been in here while I was standing just a few feet away. Someone had left me a message and vanished without a trace. I checked the locks on the door, even though I knew they were secure. Then I checked the windows. Everything was as it should be, but that didn't make me feel any better. I sat down at the table, trying to think. The first message had been creepy, sure, but I'd been able to brush it off as a prank. This one, though, it was too deliberate, too personal. And the fact that it had been left inside my house while I was distracted, that made my skin crawl. My thoughts kept going back to the police. Had the officers been involved in this somehow? Or was it just a coincidence that they showed up on the same day I received these letters? I didn't want to believe they were part of whatever was happening, but it was hard to ignore the timing. Someone had tipped them off about me. Someone knew I had accessed the dark web, and now they were watching me closely enough to leave these letters without me even noticing. I thought about calling them, telling them about the second letter, about how someone had been inside my house. But then what? What was I supposed to say? That I'd been on the dark web for a couple of hours, and now I was getting cryptic notes from some shadowy figure? They'd probably think I was paranoid. And besides, they'd already told me to call if I noticed anything strange. I wasn't ready to escalate this yet. I decided to search my house instead. Maybe there was something, anything that would explain how someone had gotten inside without me knowing. I started in the kitchen, checking the back door, the windows, even the vents. Everything was locked, secure, exactly how it should be. I moved through the rest of the house, room by room, looking for any sign of forced entry or anything out of place, but there was nothing. It was like the letter had appeared out of thin air. As I searched, I kept thinking about the chat room. That's where it had all started. Maybe there was something I missed. Some clue in the conversation, something in the code of the page. I grabbed my laptop, booted it up again, and opened Tor. The chat room was still gone, of course, but I tried retracing my steps, looking through my browser history, trying to find anything connected to that page. That's when I noticed something strange. I hadn't seen it before, probably because I wasn't looking for it. But tucked between a few random URLs in my history was a link I didn't recognize. It wasn't one I'd clicked on, at least not intentionally. The URL was another random string of letters and numbers, just like the one that had led me to the chat room, but this one had no description attached. My curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked on it. It didn't load right away. The screen stayed black for a while, with a little spinning circle in the middle like the site was struggling to connect. I was about to give up when suddenly the page flickered to life. The layout was eerily similar to the chat room, but this time there was no list of usernames, no cryptic messages, just a single video file embedded in the center of the page, its thumbnail blacked out. I hesitated, my finger hovering over the trackpad. This was probably a terrible idea. After everything that had happened, the black letters, the police visit, the second message left inside my house, this was the last thing I should be doing. But I couldn't stop myself. I clicked play. At first, the screen was black. Nothing. Then, after a few seconds, the camera focused on what looked like a poorly lit room, maybe a basement or a storage space. The walls were bare, concrete. There was a single chair in the middle of the room, and on it sat a man. 
His face was blurred out, like someone had deliberately obscured his identity, but the rest of him was clear. He was sitting perfectly still, his hands resting on his knees, his posture unnaturally stiff. I leaned in closer, watching, waiting for something to happen. The video was silent, no background noise, no movement, just the man sitting there. Then suddenly, he stood up. He walked toward the camera, his figure growing larger and more distorted as he got closer. For a second, I thought he was going to reveal his face, but just as he reached the camera, the video cut to black. I sat there, staring at the screen, unsure of what I had just watched. There was no explanation, no context, just that unsettling image of a faceless man in an empty room. Then the screen flickered again, and a new message appeared in the same typewriter font as the letters, You shouldn't have looked. I slammed my laptop shut, my heart pounding in my chest. Whatever this was, it wasn't a joke. Someone was watching me, and they wanted me to know it. For what felt like an eternity, I just sat there staring at the closed lid of my laptop. My mind was racing in every direction, but I couldn't settle on any explanation that made sense. The video had been short, simple even, but something about it was deeply wrong. The man's blurred face, the sterile empty room and that final message. You shouldn't have looked. It felt like a direct threat, as if someone had been waiting for me to stumble onto that site expecting me to make the wrong move. I couldn't ignore it any longer. This wasn't just some prank, and it wasn't a coincidence. Whoever these people were, they knew more about me than I was comfortable with. They had left that first letter under my door, found a way inside my house to leave the second one, and now they were taunting me with cryptic videos. I knew what I had to do. I needed to disconnect to get as far away from this whole mess as possible. Whatever curiosity had led me to the dark web was long gone, replaced by a very real sense of danger. I grabbed my phone, fully intending to call the police and tell them everything, about the letters, the video, all of it. But then I stopped. What if I was too late? What if the police wouldn't believe me? After all, I had nothing concrete to show them, just a couple of vague letters and a video on a part of the internet that most people didn't even know existed. Even if they did take me seriously, what could they really do? Whoever was behind this clearly knew how to cover their tracks. The chat room was gone, the video link probably wouldn't work again, and those letters? They were nothing but paper. No fingerprints, no identifying marks. Nothing. I put my phone down and rubbed my temples, trying to think. There had to be another way to figure this out, some way to get ahead of whatever was happening to me. I just needed to stay calm and logical. I needed a plan. I thought back to the man in the video. The blurred face, the eerie stillness, something about it bothered me more than anything else. Why blur his face but not the rest of him? What was the point? And why show the video to me? If this was just meant to scare me, it was working, but there had to be something more to it. There had to be a reason. I reopened my laptop, hesitating for a moment before turning it back on. The screen flickered to life, but I didn't open Tor this time. Instead, I went back through my browser history, looking for the link to the video. As I expected, it was gone, completely erased, as if I had never clicked on it in the first place. I wasn't surprised. Whoever was behind this had clearly gone to great lengths to cover their tracks. But then I noticed something else. Tucked between the usual browsing activity, news sites, YouTube, and emails, was something that didn't belong. It wasn't a URL this time, just a small file that had somehow downloaded itself without my knowledge. The name was just a jumble of random letters and numbers. No extension. Nothing that would give away what it was. I clicked on it, half expecting it to be some sort of virus, but instead a folder opened. Inside there were more files, each one labeled with a date. I scrolled through them quickly, my breath catching in my throat as I realized what they were. The files were recordings of me. 
Each one was a time-stamped video showing me in different parts of my house going about my day completely unaware that I was being watched. I clicked on one, a recording from a few days ago, and sure enough, there I was, sitting on my couch, scrolling through my phone. The angle was strange, like it had been captured from some hidden camera in the corner of the room. I fast-forwarded, and the video shifted to me walking into the kitchen, making coffee, and sitting down at the table just as I had done that morning. I could feel my hands shaking as I clicked through more of the files. There were dozens of them, all showing me in various rooms of my house, cooking, watching TV, sitting at my computer. They even showed me sleeping, the camera capturing my motionless form lying in bed, completely oblivious to the fact that someone had been watching my every move. I slammed the laptop shut again, my pulse pounding in my ears. How had this happened? How long had I been watched without realizing it? And more importantly, who was behind it? I bolted up from the chair, my eyes darting around the room, scanning every corner, every possible spot where a camera might be hidden. I checked the vents, the smoke detectors, even the light fixtures, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. No hidden lenses, no wires, nothing that would suggest I was being recorded. But the videos didn't lie. Someone had been in my house, planting cameras, and they were watching me in real time. My heart raced as I grabbed my phone again. This time I didn't hesitate. I dialed the number on the card the officer had left me, my fingers trembling as I pressed the call button. The line rang once, twice, and then connected. This is Officer Rains. The familiar voice of the female officer answered. I... I need help, I stammered, trying to keep my voice steady. I found something. Someone's been in my house recording me. I think they've been watching me for days. There was a brief silence on the other end of the line. Recording you? Can you explain what you found? I have video files on my laptop, I said quickly, pacing the living room. They're of me, videos of me in my own house. They've been spying on me I don't know how long, but I stopped mid-sentence as a cold realization hit me. The police had been here. They'd been in my house, talking to me, looking around. Had they known? I didn't want to believe it, but the timing was too perfect. The officers had shown up right after I received the first letter, and then the second one had appeared in my kitchen while I was distracted by them. I hadn't even thought to question it at the time, but now it seemed obvious. The letter had been placed there while they were inside my house. And if they hadn't seen anything suspicious, why hadn't they noticed the cameras? Are you still there? Officer Rains asked, her voice pulling me back to the moment. I... I don't know who I can trust, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. What do you mean? She asked, her tone shifting. I didn't answer. Instead, I hung up the phone, my mind racing. I couldn't shake the feeling that the police were involved, or at the very least, knew more than they were letting on. I was being watched, manipulated, and whoever was behind this was playing a game that I didn't understand. I needed to get out. I couldn't stay here. Not with the possibility that every move I made was being monitored. I grabbed my keys, my wallet, and my jacket, heading for the front door. I didn't have a plan, but I knew I couldn't stay in the house any longer. Just as I reached for the door handle, my phone buzzed with a new text message. I glanced down at the screen and my blood ran cold. Don't leave, we're already inside. I froze with my hand on the doorknob staring at my phone. The message was short, simple, but its implications were horrifying. Don't leave. We're already inside. My first instinct was to swing open the door and run. But where would I go? The thought of leaving made me feel even more vulnerable. If they were already inside, then who knew what, or who, was waiting for me outside? I quickly locked the door again and took a step back, trying to think. The house felt different now, like every corner could be hiding someone, like every wall had eyes on the other side. I glanced around the living room, searching for anything unusual. 
The blinds were still drawn, the furniture in its usual place, but I knew better now. Whoever had been watching me wasn't hiding in plain sight. They were using technology, hidden cameras, remote access, and somehow they were everywhere at once. And now they'd made their move. The question was, why hadn't they done anything yet? What were they waiting for? I needed help, real help. My paranoia about the police seemed less important now. I couldn't deal with this on my own, but I didn't want to make another call, not after that cryptic message. What if they were listening too? What if they knew everything I was doing? The thought made my skin crawl. I decided to text instead, keeping it short and to the point. I pulled up Officer Rain's number and quickly typed out a message. Someone is in my house. I need help now. Please send backup. I didn't wait for a reply. I knew they'd trace the message, and if they were legitimate, they'd come quickly. If not, well, I'd deal with that when the time came. And the, With my heart hammering in my chest, I took a deep breath and walked back to the living room trying to stay calm. I had to get control of the situation, at least enough to figure out what was happening. I checked my phone again. No response yet. I set it on the table, making sure it was within reach. Then... I did something I probably should have done earlier. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen. Not that I thought it would do much good against someone who could infiltrate my home without a trace, but it made me feel a little less helpless. As I stood there, gripping the knife, my mind raced through every possibility. Who were these people? What did they want from me? I wasn't rich. I didn't have any important connections. I was just a regular guy who made the mistake of poking around the dark web out of curiosity. Was that really enough to justify all of this? And then, the realization hit me like a punch to the gut. It wasn't just the dark web. I had clicked on something. I had gone deeper than I was supposed to. That chat room, the cryptic messages, Zer. It wasn't just a random encounter. I had seen something I wasn't meant to see something that they were willing to go to extreme lengths to hide. I turned back to my laptop, my hands still shaking, and opened it again. I didn't know what I was looking for, but there had to be something. Some clue I had missed. I retraced my steps, trying to remember exactly what had led me to that chat room. But it was gone, erased completely from my history, from my memory. I checked the time. Five minutes had passed since I sent the text to Officer Rains. Still no response. The silence in the house was oppressive, each second stretching longer than the last. I thought about leaving again, about bolting out the door and never coming back, but the message still burned in my mind. We're already inside. And then there was a sound. It was soft at first, so faint I thought I imagined it. A quiet rustling coming from somewhere deeper in the house. My bedroom the hallway. I couldn't be sure, but it was close, too close. I gripped the knife tighter, stepping back toward the kitchen. My eyes darted to the hallway, scanning for any sign of movement. Nothing. But the sound didn't stop. It was steady, deliberate, like someone shifting their weight, moving slowly. They were inside. My heart was pounding so loudly I thought it might drown out the noise, but I forced myself to stay still listening. The sound moved, growing fainter, as if it was heading toward the other side of the house, toward my bedroom. I needed to act, and fast. I couldn't just stand there waiting to be caught off guard. I took a deep breath and crept toward the hallway, knife in hand. If they were inside, I needed to know where. But as I approached the hallway, my phone buzzed on the table behind me. I spun around, startled, my pulse racing. It was a message from Officer Rains. Stay where you are. We're on our way. Relief washed over me, but only for a moment. Whoever was in my house was still here. The police might be coming, but I wasn't sure I had time to wait for them. I took another step toward the hallway, determined to get a glimpse of who or what was in my house. But as I reached the corner, something stopped me in my tracks. A voice. Quiet, muffled, but unmistakable. 
It was coming from the bedroom, low and steady, like someone speaking in a hushed tone. I couldn't make out the words, but it was there, cutting through the stillness of the house. My phone buzzed again, pulling my attention away from the voice for a split second. Don't go in there. The message sent a wave of panic through me. How could Officer Rains possibly know what I was doing? How did they know I was standing outside my bedroom, about to step inside? I looked back toward the door, the voice still whispering faintly from the other side. I couldn't stay frozen here forever, waiting for help that might not arrive in time. With one last glance at my phone, I stepped back from the hallway, retreating toward the living room. If they were already inside, I wasn't going to confront them head on. Not now. Not when I didn't even know what or who I was dealing with. I heard the faint wail of sirens in the distance. The police were coming, and for the first time in hours, I felt a small glimmer of hope. Maybe this nightmare was finally coming to an end. But just as I thought that, the whispering stopped. The house fell silent again, an eerie, unsettling quiet that hung in the air like a heavy fog. I backed into the living room, my eyes on the hallway, waiting for something to happen. Then, the front door burst open. Two officers rushed in, their flashlights cutting through the dimly lit room. Officer Rains was the first through the door, her eyes locking on mine. Are you okay? She asked, scanning the room for any signs of an intruder. I... I think so, I said, my voice shaky. Someone was inside. They were in the bedroom whispering. I heard them. The officers moved quickly, their guns drawn as they swept through the house. I stood in the living room, my heart still pounding in my chest, waiting for them to find whoever or whatever had been inside. Minutes passed, but no one came out. Finally, Officer Rains reappeared, her expression grim. There's no one here, she said. But I heard them, I insisted. I heard the whispering. Someone was in my bedroom. She nodded slowly, but I could tell she didn't fully believe me. We'll check the cameras, she said, glancing at my laptop. We'll figure out who's been watching you. But as I stood there, I realized something terrifying. Whoever had been watching me wasn't just in my house. They were everywhere. They had never left. 